Next on Reboot Your Life. A woman with long-term recovery is now living depression-free and addiction-free for 29 years. Her insights are next. Then Ashley and I discuss the realities of post-COVID living and how depending on friends and family is more important than ever. From Riverside Recovery, it's Reboot Your Life. Experience the ultimate reboot of your journey. Start anew and rediscover you. Transform your story. Rewrite your life. It's Reboot Your Life with Carrie Harrison and Ashley Neal. From the Riverside Recovery Studios in Tampa, Florida, Carrie Harrison with you along with Ashley Neal. And thanks for listening to Reboot Your Life, where we help you get back to life you love. Make sure you subscribe to our podcast wherever you listen. Each week, you'll get new episodes both on the radio and every streaming platform. You can also check out our videos at RebootYourLifeShow.com. In 2019, to commemorate her 25th anniversary of sobriety, Sharon Facchetti authored The Broken Road to Mental Health in Life and Business. Her story isn't just about overcoming addiction and depression. It's a journey intertwined with invaluable business insights. She's known as the Dr. Whisperer and comes with a certification in mental health and wellness in the workplace from the University of South Florida. Sharon reminds us that we're all under construction. (laughs) Truer words have never been said. So to help us rebuild ourselves, reboot ourselves, we welcome you, Sharon Facchetti, to Reboot Your Life. Well, thank you for having me. We are so glad you're here because this is exactly the right beat, the right dance step that we like, which is how to rebuild, reboot ourselves and become uh, higher functioning creatures. You have many years of recovery, so we love to hear people with long term recovery be able to tell us some of the secret dance steps that have worked for them. In your book, you talk about having previously attempted suicide, something not uncommon to many of us during these times. What was happening then that later caused your shift? I wish that there was like an easy uh, story to tell, but I think that many people that are in recovery or trying to get sober have struggled with some type of additional uh, mental health issue. Uh, I look today being, you know, sober for a long time as I drank alcohol and I took drugs as my medication because I did not feel good about myself. So that pain was way deep inside of me for many years before I got sober. And it was only until I dealt with the underlying pain in therapy, outside help, recovery, all the things that I was able to uh, put that depression cap on, you know, Uh, but I would say that the thing that I work on the most today is the um, is the depression and never wanting to go back to that place. So that's, you know, and that's not, that's why I always say that we're, we're all under construction because that has never gone away for me. I still have to do a very active uh, process daily to make sure that I feel good and that I can show up for work and be in business and do all the things. So it is uh, it is definitely a daily practice. I'm guessing that uh, a lot of people, certainly in new recovery, uh, don't can't even fathom what it's like to go back into the real world because for so many of us, me included, uh, I had only one way of knowing my life, and that was the way I grew up, and that was the way that I drank, and that was the way that I lived, and suddenly there's a brand new way of living, and I hadn't physically experienced it yet. So it was a new road, untraveled, and it was theoretical, which it certainly was to you. But you found a way to actually walk this road and make it an awesome road. And now you have an expertise because of it. Well, I will give a huge shout out to employee assistance programs. It is a, a very big part of my story. So in my book, I talk about Tuesdays with Ben. Ben Figueres was my uh, father's employee assistance program counselor. So I was 21 years old when I got sober. I'm 51 today. And when I got sober, I, you know, I had a traumatic story like most, a lot of people do, you know, not everybody blacks out and moves to Detroit, Michigan from New York, but hello, that's me. I'm the problem. But it's uh, amazing that my father, who was the boss at New York hospital had been seeing this 
employee assistance program counselor while I was away. So his daughter is in Detroit, Michigan, homeless, addicted, and drinking. He has no idea. My mother has no idea where I am. And he was seeing this uh, resource that was a part of his company offering, right? He was seeing Ben. So when I came back uh, from this blackout that I stayed in for a good three years in Detroit, Michigan, uh, I went to see Ben too. So full circle for me to speak so much about mental health in the workplace because it was in fact an employee assistance program and that resource in that company, New York Hospital, that um, was the reason that I got out of that depression. You know, he was the only one, uh, and I had been to many, many, I think a lot of us relate that are on this this broken road to mental health. Uh, many counselors, I had been to two rehabs, a detox, uh, a mental institution in between going from a rehab to a halfway house um, from 18, 19 uh, years old. So it wasn't like he was the first counselor I'd ever seen, but he was the first one that asked me if I was having suicidal thoughts. And that was such a profound question uh, for him to ask and for me to answer because that was the end of isolation for me. Now the secret's out. Uh, I was hiding all of this pain and, and planning my death, even though I was sober and in recovery and going to meetings. If it wasn't for that man asking me that question on that day, I don't know if I'd be sitting here today. So Sharon, I know that Ben and the EAP services were so important. And you know so much about resources, not only where you grew up, but also where you live now. What resources do you know about for someone that may find themselves at where you found yourself that does not have access to an EAP? Yeah, well, that is the unfortunate situation I feel like most employers are in, especially like a small business that wants to provide some type of a resource. I think that before we even talk about resources, though, we really need the leaders within organizations to start having brave conversations about mental health in the workplace. So I was just brought into a company just last week, and I was very grateful to be there. There had been uh, a suicide with one of the staff members and another death with one of the staff members. They were a very close knit group and they didn't, they had never had a conversation about mental health in the workplace. So just opening up a conversation and having somebody guide the leaders. Now, the unfortunate part about that, I will say, without mentioning what group it was, is that the leaders weren't there, just the employees. So that is, that is a mistake. I need to make sure that um, I'm, I'm clear about how we introduce conversations like this into the workplace. We have to have leadership on board. And I think it's always best that leaders are brave enough to reach out to people within the community that have a background, uh, have lived experiences fantastic. You know, I, sometimes I think that it's a mistake when we bring in and you know me, I, I work with doctors for the last almost 30 years, so I love me some doctors. But sometimes we, we need a little more than a psychiatrist, a psychologist, a therapist to come in, people that have had lived experience that understand what it feels like to be in these tough situations and just creating a space where somebody could share and then having somebody that has you know active listening skills to listen to them because that is a big piece of it. We don't always have to have an EAP program. Sometimes we just need to have people within an organization that can be a safe, courageous space for people to have these kinds of talks. I promise you the worst thing that we can do is not have a communicated, uh, not have a, a conversation about it. Communication is key. It's all of this. So resources like, you know, today, Anybody that is uh, within the 12-step recovery world, like I am, 
what I would have given to have some Zoom meetings that I did not have to put my camera on or my microphone on and just jump in like, like a good old voyeur and see what's going on and listen to other people talking about it. I think that is huge. Uh, NAMI, the National Association for Mental Illness, has a lot of great resources. The disadvantage to that is that they're not 24 hours like they are with 12-step recovery programs. So there are free resources out there where people can listen to other people that are struggling, which I think is very, very helpful because nobody wants to feel like they're alone. So just hearing that somebody else has gone through something and then survived and then thrived on top of it can be very helpful. And then look, this is a podcast, this is a radio show. There are so many great podcasts that I listen to and that I recommend to others. And then there's books. So there's, I like to offer practical resources. I'm not just about you have to spend all of this money to have an employee assistance program, but you do have to do something. I, I will be clear when I say that companies can make the greatest impact. I am a living testament to that. If it was not for that EAP counselor, I, I certainly would have uh, had a much, it would be a surprise if I was even here, but who knows? But I think that educating employers is we can make a bigger impact that's why i'm so passionate about it hang on your reboot reboots in a moment riverside recovery of tampa was created to offer state-of-the-art treatment options to people suffering from addiction the model was developed to meet clients and their families where they are at and provide them with the tools and education needed so that they can achieve long-term recovery no two people are the same and no two people have the same experience with addiction and it is for this reason that we tailor each treatment plan to the unique needs of each individual located alongside the hillsborough river in the heart of tampa riverside recovery offers the full continuum of care and what that means Means is that we offer medical detoxification, residential care, day treatment, intensive outpatient, and outpatient levels of care. The program at Riverside is focused on high quality clinical care offered in a safe, comfortable, and serene environment where everyone feels empowered to change the course of their lives. The stigma that surrounds addiction continues to be high on the list of reasons that people do not seek help. At Riverside Recovery, we are working to change the narrative and empower people to recognize addiction as a disease, not a moral failing. We can recover, and we do, as evidenced by the thousands of people who have taken that courageous first step and asking for help. The staff at Riverside understand what it's like to recover. In fact, over 75% of our staff are in long-term recovery. If you or someone you know needs help and are ready to seek treatment, call Riverside Recovery of Tampa at 1-800-871-5440. That's 800-871-5440. You can learn more about the treatment we provide at rrtampa.com. Again, that's rrtampa.com. Check out our Reboot Your Life hotline. We've set up a dedicated phone number so you can leave your comments, thoughts, and feedback whenever you'd like. It might even get on the air. Maybe you have a story that you feel needs to be shared or told. So, get it off your chest. Text or call our Reboot Your Life hotline at 323-8-REBOOT. That's 323-8-REBOOT. Reboot. 323-8-REBOOT. 323-8-REBOOT. Life 2.0. It's your life and your reboot. It's Reboot Your Life with Carrie Harrison and Ashley Neal. Oh, I was going to say, I would I would speculate that that is where the, uh, the idea for your book came along um, because your book is uh, The Broken Road to Mental Health in Life and in Business. It's not just in life or just in business. We're in company, encompassing both of those. So just your own personal story and your personal experience working with so many businesses, but also having the experience of finding recovery in your own life. I would assume that's where the idea for your book came from. Yeah. You know, I mean, 2019, right. Pre pandemic, who knew what was going to happen next, but really I had been running medical practices for a very long time. And then I've been on my own for the last 10 years consulting, um, and doing a lot of wonderful things in the Tampa Bay community and beyond in the business sector. And what I always saw when I was tasked with something like restructuring a business or how can I have a better culture um, in my business or why is there so much turnover? It was always because there was just a, a disconnect 
within communication um, from the top down. So I, I really thought that I had a great opportunity to show people that even somebody like me, who a lot of people didn't know that I was even sober. I wasn't going around telling, you know, uh, neurosurgeons that I was working with that I was, you know, sober <laughs> and I tried to kill myself. That wasn't the plan. But I knew that I had an opportunity to make an impact. And I, I really thought that if I could tell my story and then parallel how my life in business, uh, my life, and then how it impacted my business career, because, you know, when we get sober, especially, you know, people that have had a, a traumatic uh, journey like I did, I, I was so grateful to have an opportunity to not just, you know, somebody give me a paycheck, but then to go on and have businesses and positions give me, you know, money and trust me. But that came because uh, of all of the values in this design for living that I had with getting sober and, and understanding that every day is a gift. So, Yes, the business life parallel and the business tips, it, it's, it all comes back to there's no division between our personal lives and our business lives. I don't care what anybody says. Um, we shouldn't be told, you know, leave that at home. This is business. This is just business. I know I heard that a lot in, in my generation growing up in business. It, it's, you know, we can't, you know, my father today has Alzheimer's and uh, I just left the elder law attorney. I can't just turn that off and, you know, be so excited that's why I have to implement a very serious mental health workout every day so I can face that, so I can deal with that and then go to work and handle my business and, and just make sure that, you know, I'm taking care of mind, body, and spirit throughout my day. And we can teach that to people that are, are working for us and with us, but it can't just be something that's a hashtag month, like, you know, mental health awareness month coming up in May. Very happy for the hashtags, but we need to do a little <laughs> bit better than that. Ashley uh, wisely referred to you as a superstar earlier, and it's really quite obvious, uh, having gone through such a history, and then you are a testament to resilience, not only bouncing back, but then moving forward at such a, a vast speed with so much accomplishment where companies entrust you, as you said, um, you're teaching uh, organizations that it's okay to talk about mental illness, that yes, it may have been a taboo for seven, eight hundred years. But in these modern times, this is where we're all at. And this is what actual humans go through. So you're really breaking barriers, breaking glass ceilings and paying it forward. And that's part of the thrust of your book, that paying it forward is also important. Yeah. And I, thank you for that. But I also don't want to be resilient anymore, to be honest with you. I've had enough. And I think that we talk a lot about being resilient and how, you know, to pull up your bootstraps, that conversation has to stop. I don't, I don't want that for anybody. I don't want to, I don't want any more tests, right? But when it comes to how we have to, especially coming out of the pandemic, how we've had to now restructure how we live our lives and then how we work, you know, being kind to somebody else throughout the day can be magical, right? Just one little thing. There are so many little things that we can do to make a difference. And especially, my goodness, in the medical community, I mean, I there's a lot to be said about what can be done to make little changes, but it starts with telling our stories and, and, and being vulnerable. I realize that it's not for Everybody. Trust me when I tell you, I realize, and I don't think every HR rep today needs to tell a vulnerable story. That's, and they're not built to be therapists. That's why we have to be able to give resources and, and let everybody know, you know, it's okay to ask for help. It's okay to reach out. And I'm a and therapy coach. So there you go. Yeah, if you don't put your hand out, it won't get shaken. And people can't, unfortunately, mind read as much as we wish they can, or yeah. even read visual signals. They might think they're going to mistake it or get in trouble for saying, are you okay? So right. I guess it's up to us to learn how to put our hand out and ask for help and find out that it's really okay. And that's the experience that you show people is that people do want to help, actually. Like, we enjoy that as humans. Yeah, we really do. And, you know, Carrie, I don't know if you've come across this or not, but there are a lot of people that just don't know how to listen. And that is big in the workplace. If we ask somebody how they're doing, 
And then they start talking about what's going on with them. And then we compare it to their cousin in Ohio that's going through the same thing. You're telling me that you can't hear me. That's what you're saying. And then what I'm mm-hmm. saying is not important enough. So th- there's small little skills that we can teach people in the workplace, especially to listen to what somebody is saying and give them the space and the opportunity to feel seen and heard. Do you have any, uh, to finish this up, some practical tips that you found uh, really effective in maintaining mental well-being in business, at work, in life, which you point out are really all the same thing? Yeah, it's so practical for me. Uh, I'll just talk about me. Um, I I get up every morning at 5.30 and I work out and then I meditate and then I walk my dog and then I have coffee with my husband and then I work. I don't do it the other way. I put myself as the priority so I can be a better human being for others. I go to therapy still 30 years sober. I'm still very active in 12 step recovery. I'm kind. I say hello to people. I ask them how they are. And then I listen to them. I think that we can really, really um, uh, encourage how we are thinking by what we are eating, what we're putting into our body. There are so many practical things we can do. I only listen to good things in my ears, like this great radio show and great podcasts. My circle around me is positive. I keep people around me that are not toxic, (laughs) you know, Um, and, and I really think that being out in nature is a wonderful, us living in Tampa Bay, Florida is the most beautiful gift that we have and it's free. We could just go out and take a walk. I won't be walking outside in August, but. (laughs) Cause you're smart. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it's very practical, but I really think that, you know, asking for help is a great thing to do. So it's our response, my responsibility. If I have been on the other side of that and know what it's like, to tell somebody else that so they feel okay to ask for help too. There's a secret that you know about that I that Ashley knows about that I know about, but maybe not everyone. And I'm a little, you know, reserved to leak this secret, but it's called Lettuce Lake Park. And it mm-hmm. is next to USF. And it is a boardwalk that runs maybe a half a mile uh, through 900-year-old cypress trees and hanging Spanish moss. Mm-hmm. And it is the most spectacular natural phenomenon. And if you want to connect with nature, much as Henry David Thoreau, who gave us Walden Pond, an early American philosopher, and taught us about the idea of meditation, um, after whom uh, Mahatma Gandhi modeled his movement, uh, Dr. Martin Luther King. These are early Americans who really understood the importance of intertwining with nature and finding that spiritual balance. Lettuce Lake Park, you can just Google it, is one of these mystical places and it happens to be right next to usf that has brought so many of us a new life it seems lately uh look at you here sharon facchetti author keynote speaker uh i'll bet you 25 30 years ago didn't imagine you'd be an author and a keynote speaker no my goodness the fact that people pay me to talk about mental health in the workplace is a dream, you know, and I'll be able to do that at a medical society in August in Savannah, Georgia, you know, at a resort, like, please, my life is beyond my wildest dreams only because I was willing to tell somebody else that um, I too, you know, have struggled and that it's okay. And that we're, we really all as much as, as cheesy as it can be, we really all are in this together and the only way out is is with each other. Community uh, is just vital. Um, we have a design for living, and my design for living needs to carry out to the people that that don't know about it. So uh, I'm very grateful to have the opportunity to talk about it. And I'm totally with you. Any park that's got some trees with some moss hanging, I am right there with you. <laughs> Looks like we have a field trip coming up, don't we? I love it. Let's do it. We- We'll do that. Well, we want to thank you, Sharon Facchetti, author, keynote speaker, who is you've shared your story of overcoming addiction and depression, emphasizing the importance of mental health in the workplace. 25 years, soon 30 years of recovery, uh, advocating for utilizing free resources and a 12-step recovery program, which continues 
almost 90 years later to be uh, the central core of tens of millions of people's successful and ongoing recovery. Sharon's message focuses on the need for continuous self-improvement and passing on the gift of mental wellness, which it is a gift when you get it, once you find it, hold on to that tightly. We want to thank you for joining us today on Reboot Your Life. Thank you. I got to interview her when I worked at um, the other treatment center on the podcast that we had, but the boss that I had at the time had known her for a while. Um, she, in her work at doctors, with doctors, if I remember correctly, she um, at the time was working for a pediatrician and pediatricians very often are having people come into their practice up until like 19, 20, something like that. And some of these um, adolescents were needing treatment. So Sharon put it on herself to go out in the community and find the resources. So um, she came across um, some of the treatment providers in the Tampa Bay area. And that's how she got connected um, really within that space. And to be able to have like the moniker Dr. Whisperer, mm -hmm. that's big. Like you actually have to have some real skill sets. And you were saying earlier, Ashley, that that um, Sharon wasn't trained the way other uh, clinicians are, you know, years and years and years of schooling. She she went in as a grown up and pulled this off pretty much on her own. Yeah. She was a sober person and able. Yep. Yeah. And she, um, I guess by trade, really what she did is manage uh, medical practices. But in that she saw the need for leaders within the organizations or within the medical practice to really, you know, take charge of incorporating mental health conversations in the workplace. And that is really, you know, the catalyst for her book. I mean, 2019, that was her 25th sober anniversary. So she had at that point been working for like 20 years managing medical practices and a lot of small medical practices don't have an HR department, you know, they kind of just have somebody that does the intake paperwork and, uh, you know, somebody that works in billing, but, and, you know, maybe at that time, um, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, not a lot of them. I mean, I don't even know how new of a concept EAP is. I remember my sister who was in that business, this is 20 years ago, and I asked her, what is EAP? And only really big companies had EAP because, and it was kind of a logical business decision for them at, the, at that time, which was productivity, productivity. And if people are depressed or are dealing with a lot of personal stuff and there's no place to get it fixed, if the company gets it fixed, then you got an employee that's going to put in a good solid eight hours. Uh, yeah. And now, right? Now it's yeah. become a way of life. Yeah. Well, I, <clears throat> I think that, um, you know, maybe there were along the way people just realized that EAP needs to be more than making sure that your employees are productive. I mean, yes, we pay them to be productive, but in order for them to be productive, and I think Sharon said it beautifully, we need to be able to say like, hey, I have some external things going on that are impacting my ability to work. Hmm. And um, I was actually just thinking about this the other day with myself when I um, when the pandemic started, I moved. And when I moved, I was in a place at, at my new house where you see me right now. I'm in my dining room. This is where I work. I don't have a space to work. And my spouse is here working as well. And we're kind of sharing the space during the workday. And this is not something we had ever done before. And if, I mean, with the pandemic, nobody had ever had a pandemic before or gone through one. So there was nobody to ask other than just everybody else who was kind of flying by the seat of their pants. Like, how are you doing this? What are you doing? You know, and that's really when I recognized, like, this is really impacting me. Um, this is impacting my desire to get up in the morning. This is impacting my desire to, you know, excuse my language, get my shit together so I can work for the day. And um, 
you know, there was so much civil unrest going on and that was uh, contributing to my mental health, I think as well, watching the news and, and I had to make some decisions and do some things differently. And it was much like what Sharon talked about. I had to, you know, to make a change what time I got up in the morning, um, make a point to do some type of something, whether it's, you know, a, a meditation from a book, or if it is getting up and putting on my tennis shoes and going for a walk for an hour, which is my form of meditation, come back, get ready, and then work. I stopped waking up and immediately grabbing my cell phone to read my work emails. It wasn't the first thing that I did. Uh, when I go to a 12 step support meeting, I don't take my phone in, I leave it in the car, I just I had to make some changes to put myself in the moment and, and experience what was happening in that moment, without distractions to impact my mental health. I was in LA during uh, the coronavirus. It's interesting, we uh, most of us don't talk about it anymore, but it changed everyone's life forever in so many ways. And in California, we were locked down. Here in Florida, not locked down. Maybe in the beginning a little yeah. bit, but yeah. it kind of opened up. The rest of us were in handcuffs. You know, it was <laughs> illegal to mm -hmm. go outside unless you're walking your dog. Mm -hmm. unless you're going to the grocery store to get what's called food, because apparently the human body requires it a couple of times a day. Yeah. So they made these exceptions. But literally, if, if a cop in his squad car with his mask on saw you walking around on the sidewalk, it was like, what are you doing? Where are you going? And it really changed everything. And uh, I remember trying to get to a 12-step meeting, none, zero, locked down. So people went over a year with no in-person 12-step opportunities to like really talk to other people. And this is where Zoom blew up. And if you remember Zoom in the very early days, they were called Zoom bombers. Oh, yes. Yes. And so they would publish the links to some of these mm -hmm. online gatherings. And 15-year-olds who have never been locked down, I mean, trying to keep a 15-year-old at home anyway, say, but you're going to stay home for, oh, six months. <laughs> you know, what is a 15 year old going to do is I want to blow it up, whatever it Get is. Into trouble. It yeah. is. And so they discovered Zoom and all the grownups are in there having these like heart to heart conversations. <laughs> and they would come in and say, seriously, they're most wretched and, and put images up and share just. I wouldn't even call it porn. It's kind of a, a level above that. And, <laughs> and that was kind of but it was cool because it, it helped us all kind of refix and readjust. And then uh, some people got smart and said, well, let's go outside and try to have 12 step meetings, you know, around a lake or behind a tree or hide in a parking lot. And so we started to integrate. But I think so many of us got to readjust. And yet we both know, Ashley Neal, you and me, we both know people who are still stuck in their COVID mentality. Riverside Recovery of Tampa was created to offer state-of-the-art treatment options to people suffering from addiction. The model was developed to meet clients and their families where they are at and provide them with the tools and education needed so that they can achieve long-term recovery. No two people are the same and no two people have the same experience with addiction. And it is for this reason that we tailor each treatment plan to the unique needs of each individual. Located alongside the Hillsborough River in the heart of Tampa, Riverside Recovery offers the full continuum of care. And what that means means is that we offer medical detoxification, residential care, day treatment, intensive outpatient, and outpatient levels of care. The program at Riverside is focused on high quality clinical care offered in a safe, comfortable, and serene environment where everyone feels empowered to change the course of their lives. The stigma that surrounds addiction continues to be high on the list of reasons that people do not seek help. At Riverside Recovery, we are working to change the narrative and empower people to recognize addiction as a disease, not a moral failing. We can recover, and we do, as evidenced by the thousands of people who have taken that courageous first step and asking for help. You can discover more at rrtampa.com. That's rrtampa.com. Or reach out at 1-800-871-5440. That's 800-871-5440. 1-800-871-5440. 
Learn more at rrtampa.com. Reboot your life today. I uh, have a friend who is a, a bit older than me that was very um, in the middle of the boat with in-person meetings for 35 plus years. And when the pandemic happened, they, you know, went into the little bubble and uh, went to a lot of Zoom meetings. And now I will say that I think Zoom meetings allowed us to expand our horizons and think about being in recovery spaces with people outside of our general vicinity. I know many people who now still go to virtual meetings based out of New York, based out of California, some that are based internationally, and they've met lots of people that they otherwise would never have met. They would have never gone to a virtual meeting. But some of those same people, and they are older, have continued to stay in virtual meetings and have not gone back to an in-person meeting. And, you know, it's not my place to ask, you know, or question, you know, their reasoning behind that. But um, knowing how involved they were in in in-person meetings and how much they benefited from those and and how important they believe them to be to see them just go to virtual meetings now you know it it doesn't make me sad but it does say you know that's the big they were very impacted yeah there's a you know there's a universe of people who can't physically get to a meeting i mean we all know a ton of people like that. And so thank God there are virtual meetings for that situation. But, and this is my opinion, but if you can, if you can actually make it to a meeting, whatever that that is for you, do it. Just even if it's once a week, because the magic, the alchemy here, that since the very beginning of these things, even cavemen, thousands of years ago, you would sit around a fire and tell stories. And that connection, that bonding, that looking in someone's eyes, the accountability, the warmth, the love, the affection, the camaraderie, all of that happens around live people and not so much watching a TV screen. I mean, if that's all you ever knew, and we've met people who've fallen into recovery on Zoom. Yes. Like, I, I can't even wrap my head around that, but it's true. Yeah. Well, I think there there's another um, important lesson in there, too, is that people in recovery, people that have spent time in any form of support group, whether it is through something like the National Alliance on Mental Illness, whether it is family members through a 12 step support group or whether it is the person who has the substance use disorder themselves. We know how important that interpersonal connection is that seeing another human being in person that being able to shake their hand give them a hug lay eyes on them and see how they're doing but now people who are not used to spending time in those spaces people that are normies people that are business people um parents that you know have children in school um maybe people who are retired the pandemic really, I think, put us all in the same place of recognizing the importance of seeing people in person because that isolation just breeds. I mean, it is a breeding ground for depression, anxiety. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I think that that is one of the major positives that came from the pandemic is that now everyone recognizes the importance of mental health awareness because I think everyone's mental health was impacted in some way, shape or form. If there is a another pandemic, which there could be at some point, uh, I think we, those of us who've been through this one will know how to better navigate the next one and find as long as it's medically acceptable, like you don't want to take any risks. You certainly don't want to put somebody else at risk. But I know I will never be sitting in a room for one year thinking I could, oh, I can manage it because they told me to. They don't even know what this is. Um, so, you know, out of the box thinking of how to be around other people, 
uh, and, and really get that love because the isolation, even though we might fantasize being on a desert island somewhere for a month, it sounds good in theory, but after about the third day, guess what you want? People. Yeah. <laughs> as much as you think you, you know, are done peopling sometimes when you don't have the people around you and you don't have the people, then you want the people. Yeah. Now, how about relationships? Because you were married at the time during the pandemic, were you? Yeah. Yeah. So you and your husband probably never imagined every day together, all day, all night. Like people just they go to work. They get eight hours of not, you know, married. And yeah. Suddenly it's no 24 hours, 20. Oh, how many? 23 hours to go. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> you, but you, you pulled through and you guys are in love. Yes. Like, and I actually, yeah, I actually think that, um, I think the pandemic, and I believe this to be a theme for many people shown a light on a part of your life, whether it's your job, whether it is your marriage, whether it is how you parent your children, whether it is, you know, your, uh, your lifestyle, if your lifestyle was healthy or unhealthy, I think that the pandemic really was able to highlight a place or an opportunity for everyone to reflect, do some work, something like that. And I think that's what the pandemic afforded for my husband and I, it, being here, interacting all the time, managing the house together. You know, we had really kind of figured out how to um, manage our lives with responsibilities and children and dogs and, you know, going to the gym and all these things. We had figured it out before the pandemic. But once the pandemic hit, and it was like, okay, we can't do any of that that way anymore. We have to just completely reinvent um, our system. I think that it really um, highlighted some communication issues that we had. And we made the decision to um, go to therapy together. And we went to therapy for an entire year during the pandemic. And I think that it brought us a lot closer. And at that point, my husband and I had been together for around 14 years. So, you know, you think you know somebody <laughs> yeah. until a pandemic hits and then you're, you know, with them all the time. And, um, you know, I hear people say in recovery all the time that they're, you know, grateful for their, their journey before they were sober, before they were in recovery. And, and I can honestly say that I'm grateful for the pandemic in that regard. I'm not grateful for the pandemic and all of the, you know, horrible things that happened, all the deaths. And, and I'm not, you know, grateful for that. But there is a part of it that, you know, I got something positive out of it. And did you find that the traditional duties that maybe have been afforded to women and then men have, you know, cut the grass, uh, go into the garage, work on that. And, you know, the woman is doing this. Uh, did you find that there was kind of an inter interchangeability, a new interchangeability of some of those traditional duties? I would say yes. I would say that um, uh, just by nature of um, the jobs that I have historically had, I am more of a, um, you know, attend events and be out in the community and not be home you know, the traditional hours and my husband's job had evolved over the years to where it was more of a hybrid. He could work in the office some, but he could also work from home and um, being at home, both of us together for mm, about six months, because I did start to go out and work after things started to open up a little bit more here in Florida. Uh, I think we recognized that some of the roles and responsibilities around the house did have to change. Um, you know, he because he was here doesn't mean that, you know, oh, you have a free moment. You, you should be in there doing the laundry or, you know, it, it, <laughs> there definitely were a lot of changes. And, you know, historically, my husband had cooked dinner as well. And recently we have made some changes in that area, too, because, you know, when you've been cooking dinner for 15 years, <laughs> you kind of need a break. Or <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I. I happen to like doing laundry. I admit this freely. I find it therapeutic. 
I also probably, because it's a gadget, the washing machine, it's a, it's a machine. So I like to, you know, it's technology, but I, I like doing it. And then I actually like folding it. I know it's weird. I also like doing dishes. Mm. It's kind of a weird fetish of mine, but if you cook me a nice dinner, I will do the dishes. Yes. I think I, it's reasonable. You know, I don't mind doing the dishes either, but I think it's more of because I'm very particular about the way the dishwasher gets <laughs> loaded. <laughs> and I'm also very particular about the way the laundry is folded and put away. So I'll do all the laundry. Yeah. You just want it but, done right. But yes, but I'll do everything. I mean, I, I spent two hours outside yesterday, you know, trimming hedges at the house. So I, I, I like being, uh, what's the word? Um, Oh gosh, I can't think of the word. Um, I, I like doing things that are chores, but you know, they're also responsibilities when you become a homeowner. Yep. Well, and, and that part is uh, forever when you're a homeowner because a house more than a baby needs its diapers changed all the time. <laughs> <laughs> well, this has been fun. I, I'm, I like talking about this stuff and getting to know each other better and you know, getting our, our human side out. So I appreciate this chat today, uh, yeah. a, new, a new angle and reboot your life. And so this yeah. has been great fun. Well, Ashley Neal, Carrie Harrison here. This is Reboot Your Life, and we look forward to seeing you all next week. Learn more at rrtampa.com. Reboot your life today. Are you familiar with Riverside Recovery of Tampa? Well, they offer a profound, all-embracing approach to addiction treatment. With a dedicated team of empathetic professionals, Riverside Recovery is committed to guiding individuals on their path to enduring recovery, using a variety of science-backed therapies, counseling, and support services. Riverside Recovery values the individuality of every recovery journey. Their tailored treatment plans respond to the specific needs, the hurdles, the goals of each resident, providing effective aid regardless of whether you're taking your first steps in recovery or maintaining your progress. With Riverside, recovery isn't just achievable, it's an influential journey towards a healthier, brighter future. The testimonials of those who've undergone treatment there are evidence of rediscovered self-worth and potential. Located on the tranquil Hillsboro River of Tampa, Riverside serves as a peaceful haven, promoting self-discovery and healing. They acknowledge that recovery is about more than just overcoming difficulties. It's also about finding your innate strength and resilience. The Riverside Recovery's committed team are your empathetic allies in your recovery journey. They comprehend that genuine healing involves the mind, the body, and the spirit, meticulously dealing with all facets of addiction. You can discover more at rrtampa.com. That's rrtampa.com. Or reach out at 1-800-871-5440. That's 800-871-5440. 800-871-5440 or rrtampa.com.